Oh, 
right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I am joined by the incredible author and my friend, Rachel Wilson. How are you doing today? I'm good, Patrick. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, today, I think it'll be another fun conversation. We're going to be diving into the biblical roles of husband and wife. What exactly is a biblical marriage? Um, yeah. This came up because you were kind of going back and forth with some women online that uh, didn't quite see eye to eye. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of a, a common theme for me, yeah, especially on theme, Twitter. Sure. But That's your life. Yeah, basically. <laughs> it was, Yeah, there was a crazy conversation of two or three weeks ago when you were traveling where it was everybody from like, I would say like mainstream secular women to like Christian trad women, right? All weighing in on this big kerfuffle about of all things, who should pump the gas in a marriage? And I was like, I don't think that's super important. I don't see why women can't pump gas, not to be a feminist or anything, but I, I, it, I, you know, from my perspective, I'm the one driving and doing errands all the time. And it seems weird to ask my husband to go fill up the car when I'm generally the one who's out and about driving it and things like that. And I just didn't think it was, I didn't think it was a central issue and people had really strong opinions on it. And we went back and forth and there was just this, it, it evolved into all kinds of stuff. And then there was another discussion about pregnant women and, and if, everything should be done for them or if they're still pretty capable and just all these different conversations. And I was like, I feel like there's so much confusion out there. And I think it's because yeah. everything is so inverted and backwards these days that it's like, people really don't know what roles in a marriage are like and what, what is good and healthy and what is not good and healthy. And there was another video I just sent you before we started that's making yeah. around them here now of just a woman saying what she does in her marriage that she considers to be submission. And half the women were kind of like me going, I don't see anything wrong with it. And the other half were like, this is abuse. So there's like this huge, you know, uh, spectrum on what people think is, is appropriate, good, healthy, bad, unhealthy within marriage roles. So I was like, uh, I got to see if Patrick wants to talk about this and help clear it up a little bit from our yeah. perspective as Christians, you know? Absolutely. And uh, I'll be taking on that vow and that commitment here soon. So I thought it was a, per a perfect topic. And yeah. like you, like you highlight, I kind of was watching some of the stuff going the back and forth on Twitter. And um, even in the trad community, there's a little bit of a difference of opinions on that Proverbs 31 wife. Um, some maybe feel like they should be a little bit more pampered uh, than maybe would be readily expected. I'm all for taking care. And obviously we'll be talking some of what are the biblical roles of husband and wife. Well, for a husband, definitely leadership, protection, providing, um, being the support, uh, being sort of the backbone, uh, being the decision maker. These things are important attributes that every man needs to develop to, to lead a family. Um, but in regards to the women, uh, I think the submissiveness can also in the sort of, you know, pampering can go to a, uh, a, a an nth degree where like a debate over pumping gas. If a uh, man now, if I'm with my future wife, my fiance and, you know, I'll yeah, I'll go pump the gas. But the idea sure, that she can't yeah. pump the gas herself is a bit ridiculous. And that's when you read yeah. Proverbs 31, it talks about a woman that's toiling in soil, that's uh, that's you know, sewing clothes, that's cooking, that's raising children. I mean, she's doing a lot. She's gardening, she's cooking, she's clothing. Um, that's not somebody who's just sitting there with their feet up, uh, waiting right. for their man to do everything for them. Yes, that's and that's how I feel about it too. Now, again, there's like, like Father Josiah Trenum just did a stream on manners with women and how to treat women, which was really lovely. Um, if you're on the way to church and your wife is in her nice dress and you're, the, you're with her and driving, sure, pump the gas. That's great. But there were women saying things like, if a woman is pregnant, she should never have to do anything, period. End of story. Like her man should be doing everything. She should be sitting with her feet up for nine months, not doing anything. And I kind of took issue with that. And I think right. 
I think part of where these mentalities come from, just from my perspective, is as you guys probably know, if you haven't met me, hi, I have five kids. (laughs) (laughs) I've got five children, which 100 years ago was a very average number of kids. Um, Right. But nowadays it isn't. Right. A lot of these trad women have no kids or two kids or something by choice. Right. They're using birth control. Um, And I think this is especially with Protestant women. I think Catholic women are still I mean, it's become really liberalized, but maybe they're more more apt to have more kids and things like that. And so from my perspective, I'm sitting there going. I can't imagine I'm pregnant with number five, the fantasy world these people live in where I would ever be able to just sit back and kick up my feet and have Andrew do everything for me. Like there was a woman saying her husband like brought her her food and drove everywhere and did all the errands and just he just did everything for her because she was pregnant. And I was like, okay, when I'm on number five, I've got four other kids I've got to take care of and Andrew has to go make the money how on earth would it even be possible for me to just expect him to treat me like a princess who's totally incapacitated? That would never work. I'm like, uh, you know, potty training toddlers and homeschooling older kids and like, you know, cleaning things and doing four or five loads of laundry a day a lot of times, two, three loads of dishes a day a lot of times. And the kids can help to a point. But there was a time when I had five of them under 11 years old. So I was just, I feel sometimes like these online trad women live in a different world than I do. And to be perfectly honest, there is such a thing as the trad wife grift. Like you guys have probably seen, um, there's a gal who blew up on TikTok because she's a very busty, attractive girl and she's got blonde hair and she dresses like a 1950s housewife. I've seen that one, yeah. Yes. And it came out that she's not even married. She's just cohabitating with her boyfriend and basically LARPing as a trad wife on TikTok to get views and clicks. Right. Um, and, and they almost fetishize it. And I don't like that either. And it's not because I'm a feminist. It's not because I'm like, oh, women need to be liberated or anything like that. It's more just like, wait a minute, let's talk about what life is actually like for a traditional Christian woman once she gets married. Because... I have four daughters and I think growing up with me, they saw my life and they're not going to get the same impression as these women online who seem to think that being a trad wife just means, oh, okay, I have the long hair and wear a pretty dress and my husband does everything. And they see it, they kind of almost see it as like, oh, this is my ticket out of the nine to five. It's my ticket out of responsibility and hard work. I'll just find a trad husband and he'll do everything. He'll do all the work. He'll pay all my bills. He'll do all the thinking for me. And I can just uh, (laughs) paint my nails and uh, go to the craft store or something. And from my perspective uh, and the way that Andrew and I are, it's like, it's all hands on deck. Once you've got more than a couple of kids, especially even really once you have one, but certainly once you have several, there is no longer this like idea that anybody's just taking it easy. Everybody is doing their best. Everybody is pitching in. Everybody is working. And I never, um, you know, I never got this idea that like, oh, I don't take out the trash because that's a man's job. It's like, If Andrew's busy, if he's tired, if he's at work, I'll just take out the trash. Like we don't need to, we don't need to gender every single chore and like turn it into a thing like that. It's like, let's have a spirit of serving each other and helping each other. And that kind of takes care of it. And it might look a little different for everyone. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about was it seems like there's either this idea that you're a career woman or you're a pampered princess. And I don't identify with either of those. So (laughs) yeah, exactly. Um, so let's kind of dive more into this topic specifics then, and we can then regret, uh, regrets back to culture itself and the contemporary culture and the dating podcast, the red pill, the manosphere. So what would you describe as a biblical wife? I can go into maybe a biblical husband. I have a section here on marriage within the Orthodox Study Bible that I'd like to go through because marriage is an incredibly sacred union. Um, Our story with Adam and Eve begins with a marriage. 
And in a way, the story ends with a marriage with Christ in the New Jerusalem. So um, before we get into the masculine roles, and we've kind of re reiterated that at most on this channel, what would you describe? What is a biblical wife? What is a Christian wife? Um to me and from, you know, you guys may know that I was Protestant most of my life and, and found orthodoxy a couple of years ago. So I'm certainly not an expert and you should always talk to your priest about these things. But what I think of when I think of like a biblically Christian wife is someone who has a spirit of serving people around them. And that is because feminism has characterized this as slavery, mo modern women just equate serving someone, um, submitting, anything like that to slavery and oppression or abuse, right? right. So, but that's not what I think of. What I think of is um, we, we have tons of saints we can look to for great examples of what women are like, but I do like the story of St. Olga, who I almost chose for my patron saint because I really like her. <laughs> um, and people will read her story and think it's pretty wild, but I think that she's a great example of not equating submission with weakness because mm. you, you and your spouse are in a spiritual war together. So right. as a as a Christian wife, you kind of have to have a mentality that, yes, my husband is the general. He is the commander. He is the leader. But I'm here in this battle with him and he needs somebody who is helping, not a, a weight around his ankle that makes it harder for him to fight the spiritual battle. So anything you can do, in my opinion, that helps your husband do that, that helps your prepare your children, his children for the world. Um, without competing with him is going to be a good thing. So people think if you're strong or, you know, like I'm, I'm a pretty tough person because I've had a pretty hard life. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just not like a weak, um, like helpless person. And if I was that I, I fail to see how that would help my husband. So when I think of St. Olga, she never challenged her husband or his leadership or his authority. It was never like, oh, she wanted to be the king or anything like that. But her husband was um, tricked and murdered, basically, unjustly. Mm -hmm. And she spent the next few years kind of getting some um, retribution for that. And she certainly wasn't weak and she certainly wasn't helpless. And she was brave and she was courageous and she... Uh, converted people because of what she did. So it's like, the I just really don't like the idea of equating weakness with femininity. Uh, how are you going to give birth if you have this mentality of being weak and, and helpless and dainty, right? <laughs> and it's not that femininity has to be tough and masculine either. There's different types of women and there's different types of men. And I think that that's fine. We're talking about character and we're talking about attitude. So I think those are the two things I would I would speak to is as your character as a wife and mother should be that you can stand up for what you believe in. You have a spine and a backbone. You're not going to just cave to social pressure. Right. Because how are you going to be a Christian in the world, not in the world, but not of the world? if you can't stand up for what you believe in, or you don't know why right. you believe what you believe, how are you going to right. teach your children those things if you don't understand those things? And then your attitude has to be one of um, submission. Yes, of course, submission to your husband. But that word has been just like the word patriarchy has been so bastardized in the mainstream. <laughs> that yeah. Women hear the word submission and they think he's beating me. That's what they think. They think if you submit to your husband, that means you are offering yourself up for abuse and mistreatment. And that is not at all the case in a Christian marriage, because I'm sure Patrick's going to explain to you why men are held to a very high standard and they have a tremendous amount of responsibility. Men are responsible for the welfare and the well-being of women. A really cool right. historical fact, because you guys know I love to drop these little historical truth bombs on you every now and again. Um, prior to women's suffrage, one of the points that the anti-suffragettes would make when they would say why they didn't want the vote, why they didn't want women's lives 
uh, involved in politics is because at the time, there were actually a lot of laws on the books that were very protective of women, especially financially here in the United States. So at that time, like 1880s, 1890s, turn of the century, um, if a wealthy woman who inherited, you know, a ton of wealth from her father, yes, women were allowed to inherit wealth. Um, they were allowed to own property. Uh, they were allowed to have their own money. So if you've heard that that's not true, that's wrong. They were allowed to have those things. And if they married a poor man who had nothing, he was still responsible for her financially. He was responsible for her debts. So you mm -hmm. might hear this thrown around a lot where they say, oh, women couldn't even have a bank account or a credit card. Yeah, but they don't ever tell you the reason. The reason is because the men were legally liable for the woman's debt, right? So women would argue, no, we, we like the fact that men are responsible, that if we're going to marry a man and bear his children, that he bears legal responsibility for our welfare, even right. if we have our own money, even if um, a man wants to sell his property, his wife has to approve, but not the other way around. If she came into the marriage with property, she can sell it and he has nothing to say about it. Now, whether you think that's right or wrong, my point is that Traditionally, up until the sexual revolution and feminism took over, men were the ones who who would bear the responsibility. Men are the ones expected to die in wars, to die protecting their family. Right. That's not the case for women. So that's the reason we submit. The reason we submit is for those reasons. It's also because even as women, if we have rights, if we have rights, we have to appeal to men to enforce the rights. So if someone's violating your rights as a woman, who do you go get? You get a male police officer, you get your husband, you get your dad, you get your brother, right? So it's exactly. like, yeah, men are the ones who defend the nation. They defend the home. They're the only ones capable of those duties. And the suffragettes and the anti-suffragettes would argue about this. And the right. anti would say, no, men are the ones who have this responsibility. That's why we don't want to be involved in politics, because number one, it's going to take away protections we have, which it did. And number two, why are we going to entrust women with po political decisions when men are the only ones who can enforce laws, defend the nation? Right. Right. So a lot of what we're dealing with right now is just the fact that people hear all this propaganda. They don't know why they believe the things they believe. They just have these preconceived notions. So they hear a word like submission and they think abuse. They think, oh, he can just beat me. He can grape me and it's fine. That's never been the case as far as the church is concerned. Um, and in Protestant circles, that's a little different because Protestantism instantly fractured into all these different denominations with all these different ideas about biblical womanhood. And in my book, I talk about some of the earlier sects that had female preachers and deaconesses and things like that. So um, when I think of biblical womanhood and being a biblical wife, you should submit to your husband and you should uh, do whatever you can to be his help meet. And that doesn't mean be a doormat, don't have your own brain, be completely incapable and weak. No, because a man doesn't need a baby. Hey, that's Actually, what I was going to say. Is that, yeah, you, you didn't know, ask your wife or your fiance to marry you, which congratulations, by the way, everybody knows I was like cheerleading really hard when, <laughs> when I found out about that. But well, thank you very much. You would not ask her to marry you if you thought she was completely incapable of doing anything and needed you to do everything from pump the gas to get the groceries you know she needs a foot rub every single night like right why would you ever sign up for that that's not yeah i it. think we're in a spiritual battle together and we we both have our roles to play and we both yeah. have to be capable in those roles and the bible talks about the female as a weaker vessel but that doesn't mean weakness is a virtue and so mm -hmm. indulging in one's weakness is kind of what you're talking about with the over pampering desire of some of these trad women online that that whether they're larping or maybe they're just on their own journey and learning more and more about what that means i would say for a, a man and wanting to be a biblical husband um i need a help mate somebody that is useful somebody that does have their own brain that they can uh give me feedback but ultimately it comes down to my decision and that's where if we're going to start talking about some of the qualities of a biblical man or biblical husband uh leadership has to be number one so you can't be an indecisive man 
Uh, certainly there's times in which maybe you're indecisive about things or, you know, you need to contemplate or take more time on. But generally speaking, as a as a quality or a characteristic of oneself, uh, you need to be decisive. You need to have a purpose. You need to be going somewhere with your life. Uh, if a woman's going to help you, what's she helping you with? And that's part of, I think, another conversation and caveat for some of the people in the trad sphere, the trad Christian sphere, who are uh, quick to comment on the degeneracy of some of the women right now and the OnlyFans girls or the sexual attention they can elicit through social media. But as a man and you're wanting a wife, where are you going? She's got, as I use as a metaphor, it's like you got to build your own ship and then you got to set sail and she can decide to come on and and help you on that ship and you can grow <laughs> grow the crew by building a family and yeah. you listen to some of the manosphere i just did a stream on the manosphere and the red pill and and elliot holtz will be on tomorrow morning to talk about uh sort of christian masculinity but uh the whole point is to build a family the whole point for a christian husband is to lead protect provide, uh, be that support, be that guidance uh, for the wife and the children. And so yeah. you listen to the manosphere and the whole point of like, what is a high value man? Well, virtue and, and morality never even come into the question. High value right. means you have money. It means that you're physically fit. And it means that you then have options with women. And this then equates to high value. But OK, so then you work let's say 15 years as a man from 20 to 35. And now you have the money, you have a nice car, uh, you're decent looking, you're fit, uh, you're high value now. Well, what, what, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to then sleep with as many women as I can. I'm right. going to exercise my <laughs> options. I'm going to spin plates, as they like to say. You got to spin plates. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what's the point of dating? You see, like the, the leverage a man has in dating, actually, I would say from a Christian perspective, gives the man the leverage back. If the, if the point of the dating experience is just to have sex, the woman has all the leverage. The female right. has all the leverage. Exactly. If the point of our interaction is whether we're going to get married or not, and I'm the deciding factor of whether we're going to get married or not, well, now I've taken back the leverage in the dating scenario. I've decided uh, you know, what's going to be permissible and what's not because of the direction that I want my life and my family to go. And that's really what then a traditional woman would want. Um, so the manosphere and some of the stuff that they talk about, uh, very rarely is family creation and marriage the goal of one's development of their masculinity and their self. It, it's really just a utility for more options, more e exercising of options yes. in society. I would say you are then really just the, the counterpart to the OnlyFans girl, because in a way yes. she's doing the same thing. Yeah, and what they're doing is and I, I've had debates with some of these guys where I have said this to them. I've said, well, of course, you you can sit there and say you don't like feminists, but yes, you do. And I can prove it. The reason I know you love feminism and that you're on their side and that you're contributing to it is because you want the sexual liberation. You basically got duped, right? These men who think that um, it's fair game to sleep with as many women and spin plates not only are they creating feminists, but they are, they're basically taking advantage of things like birth control, uh, condoms, these sort of things, right? They are enjoying the fruits of feminism in that way. They think that it's a good deal. Oh, I get all the sex with none of the attachments, but right. and, and their way of trying to fix it is to tell men, well, just don't get married and don't have kids because that's where the feminism part gets you. That's their take, a lot of these men. And that's also completely wrong. In general, on these dating shows in the Red Pill Manosphere, which um, I tangle with them and I love having conversations and debates with them because I think it's important to right. have a voice in there that isn't just materialism, nihilism, uh, hedonism. This, these are like the pillars that those guys build this on. Like you said, right. what is the point? What's the overall arching point? It's just to get more chicks and get more money for what? You're then you're just gonna die and you had a fun ride. It's like well, that it reminded me of like Andrew Tate today 
talked about how he was bored, so he bought a Bentley car online, and they're going to ship it to him in Romania because he's on house arrest. And I get it, and it'd be nice to have that type of money and that type of disposable cash, but at the same time, I wouldn't change my life for his. I wouldn't want to be him. I don't want yeah. to make millions off uh, webcam girls. I don't want to... Uh, be a massive hypocrite. I don't want to like, again, with Tristan Tate and Andrew Tate and some of these Manosphere guys talk about virgin girls. You listen to F Fresh and Fit and they're always going on about virgin girls and virgin brides and and the value of a woman has to do with her purity, which I don't disagree with. That's a bit that's a biblical framework. Yeah. But then you have the same people, the same guys bragging about having one night stands with virgins and how how do you how do you get a virgin, you know, to commit and have sex with you in a month? You know, there's like a mm -hmm. video of Tristan Tate going around talking about yep. how quickly. Well, you know, these are virgin girls. So you got to take them out, you know, three or four times or five times. And then you can and then you can bring them back and then you can have sex with them. It's like so. So your whole thing is that men need to become high value. They need to make money. They need to develop social status. They need to be physically fit and strong and healthy so that they can then get with virgin girls, but don't marry those girls, sleep with those girls. So then what they become the same girl that you just criticized that yeah. the majority of girls are. I mean, yeah. it's totally nonsensical. And I think again, from a Christian perspective, the point of all relationships between men and women, um, at least romantically needs to be pointing towards marriage. And this yeah. is the big difference between the manosphere. And I would say the Christian sphere, uh, cause that's what we need to be promoting. And so I have some stuff right here, you know, the most famous, verses on what is a biblical wife come from Proverbs 31. And it says, uh, the wife of noble character uh, reads, a wife of noble character who can find one. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and work with eager hands. She is the merchant's ships, bringing her food from afar, she gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servant. She considers a field and, and buys it. Out of the earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. Again, not weakness. Yes, right. she's the weaker vessel, as the Bible yeah. says, compared to a man. But, but a female is not virtuous because she's weak and uh, you can't do anything. The idea right. that these trad girls promote this, it, it's not even biblical. When you're it's reading not. about a biblical wife, one of the things that doesn't come in is how big her boobs are, how big her butt is, how big her lips are, how good her makeup is. Um, all the sexual stuff, it doesn't mention any of this. And as we get to the bottom, it, it, it will it, you know, it, it'll say woe to those. Um, so she sees that trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night in her hand. She holds the, uh, the staff and grasps the spindle of with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor. She extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her head. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sachets. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. That doesn't sound like the weak woman that we see people in the trad sphere promoting that just, again, puts her feet up and, uh, oh, well, I'm pregnant. You know, it's like the, the, the <laughs> feminist, the left will talk about you know women being baby makers in a derogatory way yep. and then and in, in the in the opposite reaction is that then some of the trad women will just be baby makers yeah <laughs> they, they, that's all they do <laughs> yeah, and it's like well exactly. we don't need that either we need a partnership we need a collective vision and i think that's where yeah. uh men if you are going to have a christian relationship with a woman you need to be incredibly direct about where you're going and what you expect and what you want 
Um, if you're trying to like, you're, oh, I don't know if I should bring this up. You know, it's only our second date. It's only our third date. I think I, you know, I think her pink hair may mean that she's a little bit liberal or she's a little bit okay with LGBT. Then you need to like, then you're the weakness and you're, you're already going to establish the dynamic. That's going to be a poor right. Christian marriage. Again, a biblical husband, you look up, I was looking up articles today, providing protection, leadership, decision-making over and over and over. That's what the Bible talks about in regards to what is a Christian husband. Yeah, absolutely. And so something that both the feminist only fans people and the red pill manosphere people like Rollo Tomasi telling people get a vasectomy in your 20s, you know, uh, don't have any kids, the guys who say don't get married. And I, you guys probably know I'm super sympathetic to the reasons why there's this reactionary movement saying these things. I understand the reasons. I'm, I sympathize with the reasons. It's, I go on and on about it all the time because we always get these comments of people who are like, why are you blaming the men? I'm not. I'm saying I understand why they're saying this because of family court, because of divorce, because of all these things. I totally get it. But the thing they have in common, the red pill men will say, uh, don't have any kids, don't get married, get a vasectomy, uh, just live for, you know, you, it's the only way you can do it. And then the, the feminist OnlyFans girls say, well, you can't trust a man. You can't depend on a man. So you got to make your own money. You got to have your own career and you can't have any kids because if you have kids, then, you know, like it's going to interrupt your career and then you're going to be depending on a man and that puts you in danger. So they're both, like you said, feeding off each other and kind of saying the same thing. Right. And what Patrick and I are trying to say is that this is a mutual responsibility. Like this is a high responsibility life. If you want uh, the fruits of marriage and a family, and let me tell you, it's great. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about how incredibly blessed I am, especially now that I'm older, children are getting older. You can see the fruits of all those years of labor, of raising them. It's really tough when they're all small and you feel like, oh my gosh, can I even do this? It's I haven't slept in five years and it's it's really busy and it's tough. But then you get older and you're like, wow, we did this together. And now Andrew and I can look at the family we've built and, and all the kids love each other and get along and they're best friends. And we get along with all the kids and we love and get along with each other. And we have this peaceful home that is like a refuge from the world. But you don't get all of that without the responsibility and without the hard work. Right. So both the feminist only fans people and the red pill manosphere people are trying to somehow get the benefits of relationships without any of the responsibility. Both sides are doing the same thing. Right. And they're both trying to say, well, I don't want to take on any risk and I don't want to take on any responsibility and I don't want to have to trust the other person. But I do want all the benefits of the sex and the relationship and the companionship. I want all the good stuff, but I don't want to have to do anything for it. And they're both wrong for that. And this is why neither of them have a solution. Everybody knows there's a problem. Everybody knows birth rates are down hard. Uh, we have an incel issue. We have half of women are childless in their prime years. Um, yep. Nobody's having babies. Nobody's getting married. The divorce rate's going down, but it's only because no one's bothering to get married. So we know there's a huge problem. Right. But neither of these groups have the answer. Only yeah. Orthodox Christianity and, and a Christian marriage has right. the answer because it's the only thing that puts all of this in the proper lens. Right. Um, and like Andrew was sitting on the couch yesterday watching some of these Manosphere guys, and he he engages with them quite a bit, too. He's always <laughs> arguing with Alex from playing with fire and stuff. And he said, you know, I can understand how a lot of modern women hear, hear people say, oh, you should submit to your husband. And they think to themselves, why? And this is Andrew talking, guys. It's not me. He said, uh... A lot of these guys I'm engaging with, a lot of these younger men that I come into contact with, they don't want any responsibility. They want, yep. don't want to do any work. They don't want to improve themselves. Like He's like, what are they doing? They're a bunch of do nothing, sit on mommy's couch and eat the chicken tendies and the chalky milk. Yep. What woman in her right mind would ever submit to that? And that's and what like, I wanted to go to next yeah. is, the, is the problem with contemporary relationships. And one of the reasons why they're not... Um, culminating in marriage or a traditional structure is because neither party is picking accordingly. 
And so yeah. when we talk about submission, um, you know, I would agree with some of the criticisms with women in regards to, you know, uh, well, why should I submit to him or why should I? Well, uh, OK, fine. Yeah, maybe he doesn't. He's not taking on the responsibility, yeah. but that's on you. Why are you dating men that you don't deem worthy to submit to? It's the picker. I said their pickers wrong yeah. earlier. I think a previous yeah. stream that we did. It's like they need to choose the men that are worthy to submit to. Do you need to choose the woman that is worthy for you to adore and take care of, provide and protect for the rest of your life? You need to choose your partner accordingly within the confines of a Christian relationship. And unfortunately, um, nobody picks accordingly. And I would say the big problem with women, and this is where I, I would put the onus, um, you know, when a man is, when I hear stories about a man being in a marriage or a relationship with a woman that would have a lot of red flags, I would argue from a Christian perspective, I have a lot less sympathy for him. And when yeah. the woman then talks about how she can't submit to her man and he's a video gamer and he's kind of lazy and he does not really do anything. Well, I don't have any sympathy for her either because there needs to be a mutual agreement of picking according to the values and, and attributes that we want to establish a Christian marriage and relationship. Right. Right. And I think, so I always say, if you want to bring back patriarchy, we need patriarchs. You can't have exactly. patriarchy with these weak, waffly uh, men who never want to grow up. <laughs> exactly. The, the counter to that is, ladies, if you're going to sit there and talk about what men need to be doing and what a real man does and a real man behaves this way and a real man behaves that way, then you should stop rewarding the men who are behaving in the way that you say you don't want. But that's not what we see oftentimes, right? We see uh, women going for guys who are are these like red pill manosphere player types, these kind of, you know pickup artist type of guys. Uh, so you're sending them the message that this is what you want. So that's, you're going to get more of that. And men, if you're sending the message that what you want is promiscuous, shallow women, then you're going to get more of that. So exactly. And that's what we see these sides. guys. Yeah. They, they are still picking the most sexual woman they can get. Yeah. And then the, the music, the rap music, uh, it, it all glorifies the idea that you would pick this type of woman. Well, don't be surprised when she is able to find a higher value man and she leaves you because what's it built on? It's totally built on sand because the only rock to build a relationship on is Christ. And so yes. if Christ and God is not present in the relationship, then uh, it's all going to fall apart. And so it's essential that both of you are pursuing an ultimate goal that is really beyond each other. And that goal yes. is ultimately God, ultimately salvation. And then because of that, ultimately children and these th these things that you cult you're going to cultivate, but you want and you're going to grow with together. That's why it's a partnership. Um, it's not a partnership in the sense that everything's 50 50 or right. that everything has to be split 50 50. It is equally 50 50 in regards to the quality of people and value. But uh, the roles are different. But is an, it's a partnership because you guys should have aligned goals for the future. Children family, Christ, salvation, participating in the church, your parish life. Like these are things that give directionality to the relationship. Um, if you're just in a secular relationship, you know, what, what is the direction directionality? It's having fun and sex and then it gets boring and then no, yep. you're boring. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave. Well, we already have a kid. Well, I'm unhappy. Okay. So the point is that for us to be happy. It's like, it's just this vicious feedback loop because nobody is submitting to something that is beyond themselves. And I right. think that well, really when we're talking about a Christian marriage and Christian husbands and wife, it's a coming together of two people submitting to something that's both beyond themselves that brings them closer together. Yeah. And I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise that once we made marriage this like secular state uh, contract, that it began to fail astronomically and people started to just say, why do we even need this? Let's just get rid of it. Because, and and sorry, Protestants, I love you all. I love you, my Protestants, my dear Protestants. I was one for most of my life, so please don't be mad at me. But one of the reasons I address this in my book is because Protestantism is kind of, it was kind of the gateway to 
by throwing all the sacraments away, they threw yeah. away the sacrament of marriage and yeah. marriage once, you know, uh, the French revolution, the American revolution during this revolutionary period, um, when we're trying to separate church and state and people are trying to secularize things, but also still have their cake and eat it too, like Puritans coming here and, and establishing this nation. It was like trying to turn marriage into this secular government contract nobody's that's not going to be abided by when things get really rough when things get really hard and now we have under feminism created a system that incentivizes divorce it incentivizes women financially and socially to yeah. get divorced um and so then men look at that and they go well why should i do all this i'm just gonna i'm gonna lose and they do have a point and i do say this all the time we should get rid of no fault at the very least, of course, I would I would rather have it be a sacrament of the church and have people perceive it that way. That's what it should be. But at the very least, like no fault divorce shows you the principle of how if you just make this a contract, you just make it like a legal agreement. Um, any incentive to break that is not going to be too hard to find. Right. And people are just going to throw it out. They're just going to quit participating. And right. then, then you end up where we are now, where it's like children are just being raised in homes with moms that have a succession of boyfriends passing through over the years. It puts them <laughs> high risk for everything. It's yep. very dangerous for kids. And, and yep. I, I care the most about that more than I care about, you know, the manosphere being happy or the feminists having a better life. Those things are great. I want everybody to have a better, more fulfilling life and, and not do these things. But I really care about children. And this is very dangerous and risky to raise children. And we can see what's happening. Now you have Drag Queen Story Hour. You have libs of TikTok teachers trying to convince your kids that they're trans in school. And everyone goes, how did we get here? How can this be happening? I don't understand it. And it's like, who's going to do anything about it? There right. are no parents anymore. Exactly. Moms have to work full time. Dad only sees his kids six days out of the month and mom's at work all day long. This exactly. is who's raising your kids now. And you're never going to get out of that with secular solutions. You're never going to get right. out of that with government uh, contracts or laws. People are like, we just changed this law and we changed that law. No, none of that. None of that is going to be the glue that can hold a family together. Right. And I think that some of us Christians and uh, we're planning to have families is that we're going to have to make some decisions. Maybe we're not going to have the cushiest lifestyles yes. that we dreamed of. You know, maybe we're going to have to sacrifice on not having, you know, three family vehicles or one of them being our sports car and, and having all the accoutrements that we would like to have in our lives. Maybe we're going to have to make some sacrifices because we are going to try to live off a, a one person income or if or if our wives are going to have an income, maybe it's something that is able to be at home, stay at home. Yep. Maybe they can do part time or maybe they can help you with your business. If you have a business, maybe you're a plumber and she can she can handle phone calls and appointments at home. Um, yeah. there, you know, there's ways that we can. We, but we're going to have to try to figure something out because. As I've said before, over and over, as Orthodox Christians, the most valuable thing in our lives is our relationships. And yeah. we can look at the world or we can look at even modern dating and the relationships are not valued. Yeah, people want some a companion. People don't want to feel lonely. People don't want to feel rejected and that nobody wants to be with them. But they don't also value then all the things that build relationships. They just want right. somebody to serve them and make them happy we need to value relationships i'm talking the relationship with the person who picks up your trash the value the relationship with your neighbors the people at your church the people you disagree with if you have great relationships with people people will be there to help you and support you through these times but i think we're going to need to focus on relationships and then the relationships with our children and that if the woman is gone and she's allowing the daycares or the the kindergartens or whatever it is to teach your children well, then don't be surprised that your boy who you were so prized about and hoping that he would be able to take off over the family business that he identifies as a woman when he's eight years old because of the, the school's promoting it to him. I mean, you can't be surprised at that point. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so, um, I mean, we see people talking about these problems. That's the thing about both sides of the manosphere and the feminism stuff is 
Both of them are pretty good at describing the problems. Neither side is right about the solutions at all. They're dead right. wrong. And in fact, the things they prescribe are often going to make it worse. So if you guys don't know, I was just on a channel called Just Pearly Things. Um, she's a very controversial YouTuber. A lot of people gave me a lot of pushback about going on her show because they don't like her personally or they don't like some of the stuff she says that's pretty controversial. But the reason I went on, we did a show about how to have a family um, and how to make the financial part of that work being a stay-at-home mom, right? Being a woman who is not a career woman. How do you do this? Because it's the number one thing that people will say. They'll say, I can't afford it. Or they'll say to me, well, that's nice for you. You're so privileged, but we can't afford it. Well, you guys, that's what the whole show was about. I went over how Andrew and I did it. And I went over solutions to this problem because feminism, the current state of things has eliminated the family wage. It has created an individual wage. So you no longer can oftentimes raise an entire family on one income. Why right. was it in the 1950s or the 1930s that a janitor could have a family of seven and support them? But right. he can't do that now. Well, we doubled the workforce. Women are equal now. As, in fact, in some places and times in the last decade, there's been more women in the workforce than men. We doubled the workforce. We drove down men's wages. In uh, 1930s Germany, they actually had legal things put into place to have less women working in industry and factories because it was driving men's unemployment up and men's wages down. And it was becoming a big problem. And that's kind of the boat we're in. So we went over all the things because I'm I'm not silly. I'm not stupid. I understand. There's been times where I've had to take part time jobs and work from home and things like that to make it work. I understand the current situation. I'm very realistic about it. So we were trying to provide solutions and go over numbers and things like that. And that's what we did. For instance, when Andrew and I got together and, you know, we've got a bunch of kids and we're young and we don't have great income. We didn't have a lot of good job skills. We're doing okay, but it wasn't great. And when we decided we wanted to keep having kids and that I wanted to stay home, Andy had to work a tremendous amount. I mean, the man worked himself half into the grave over the course of like 12 years where he's working 60, 70 hours a week. He's hustling on the side. I'm trying to do hair from home around the kids schedule. Like it, it was tough. If we had more people doing that, it would raise men's wages and it would ease up and it would make things right. better. I think there's policy things you could do to help with that, too. But the point is, like you said, there's going to be some sacrifice involved. And right. that's tough to say to especially this younger generation that is so incredibly materialistic. I mean, you yeah. have girls now, you have girls now that go on Pearl's show and tell her, well, I need a $10,000 a month income because I've got to get my lip fillers and I've got to get my lash extensions and I've got to get my hair extensions and my hair color. <laughs> and I yeah. need a new outfit every weekend because I'm not going to wear the same outfit to the club twice like this. In, and for me, I'm just like, <laughs> I can't even imagine. I had my first child at 20 and there's never been any of that for me. However, I'm super thankful now. I'm so glad that that did not happen for me or to me, because I think that's the other reason women aren't having kids. They get used to this very materialistic lifestyle. They get used to all the treatments and all the beauty stuff and the outfits. And, you know, you have to have a certain car and a certain house. You want to live in the cool neighborhood and people get very accustomed to that. And to tell women once they're 30, to suddenly stop their career that they've spent 12 years building, suddenly stop doing all those things for themselves, don't have those. That's a tough adjustment, which is right. another reason why I encourage people, have your kids young. Don't get accustomed to a single person lifestyle and then try to suddenly turn it on its head in your 30s. That's going to be hard. It's going to hurt. It, you're right. going to find it a very difficult adjustment. So I think that's another problem with telling people to wait. And these are the things that that I like talking with you about because I don't feel like these things are covered on these dating podcasts and stuff like that either. It's a lot of back and forth about like really fiery stuff that's going to get clipped and circulated, but they don't talk about, okay, we know we want to get married and have kids, but how the heck do you make that work in this day and age? And so right. from your perspective as a man, 
how are you kind of planning your life now that you're getting married and everything so that you can have your wife at home as much as possible and 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 make your life a family life like what was your thinking going into that because i know you've thought about it a lot for me uh she had to be totally on board with what i'm trying to build and want to build it with me and she then needed to have a desire to do that a real genuine desire not something like oh well I would like you to do this. Oh, well, I think I can do that. I wanted somebody who believed in what I was doing, wanted to help me and could help me and had skills that could help me grow my business and our, my business being our business and our business then being uh, something that would be prosperous for our family and something that we could grow in and something that we could be proud of and something that could keep us sort of outside uh, you know, the matrix to a degree in regards to forced medical statuses regarding certain right. things and so uh for me making sure she was not overly materialistic and consumeristic because according to all marketing advertisers uh it's like 70 percent of all ads are geared towards women women yeah. are the consumers women spend mm -hmm. the money whether that be married or unmarried and so we are talking about a girl say it's on the pearly things or whatever fresh and fit whatever podcast um these women then expect all this money because of they are totally bought into the superficial consumerism which then the men well oh i want her look how big her tits are and look out her butt and like i need to make that money then so i can there here you go the, the manosphere high value man well i make the money and get the social status and get the the image so that then i can get the girl that has the lip fillers and everything and though i can provide what she wants and i can do the ten thousand dollars a month or whatever but then she meets uh, another guy and he can give her twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month. And now she jumps because it's consumerism. It's the same consumerism, both parties, the man and the woman. So for me and guarding going about my business of trying to find a wife, I was very explicit on what I wanted to do with my life and where my life is going. And so you have to have, you know, what exactly are the things that you're not going to compromise on? Well, I'm not going to compromise on my values, on my religion and like what my skills are and what I'm going to try to do with my life. Therefore, are you on board with those things? And through God's providence, I was able to meet the right girl that that then is all about what I'm trying to do, totally believes in it, wants to help me, has skills that could help me. And so I believe that to be God's providence, though. Um, that's not me. You know, yes, I was sifting, I would say sifting through uh, potential spouses or relationships or something. But um, to find the right person, it is providence. It's not you don't you don't just go like pick them. It's not like um, you know there's just a line of people and then you you pick one of them. You, but you need to have the things that you're willing to compromise on. There's many things I'm willing to compromise on, and then there's a few things that I won't compromise on. And if you're a man and you're talking to women and you already come across a couple things that they're they violated the things that you won't compromise on you need to end it right there and i think unfortunately because of the distorted playing field of men and women's male and female relationships right now and the women having all the leverage the men are very reluctant to say hey uh you know what you're not for me I, i'm i'm out i i can't do this or, or you're, you're i think we have different values and so they're always willing to appease and compromise on things they shouldn't compromise on and then the women aren't willing to compromise on things they should compromise on. Yes. And so the men need to take some of that, <laughs> honestly, masculine energy back and say, these are the things that I'm not going to compromise on. This is the ship that I'm building. This is where my life is going. And this is where I'm going to take it. Whether you're with me or not, are you on board? Are you a helper then? Because now yeah. as a man, once you've defined all that, she can really step into her feminine role because she knows, oh, he's doing this. I need to help him with that. Oh, we're going here. Yeah, that's where I want to go as well. This is what I want to do. Okay, we go to church every Sunday. I want to go to church every Sunday. So as a man, you have to be very definite about what you're doing and where you're going. And I think naturally then the woman will be able to accord herself to that. But if you don't know what you're doing in your life, if you don't really have the job that you want, you don't really know what your skill set is, you're kind of wishy-washy on maybe your faith or God or something. Dude, like, what do you expect? What do you, yeah. you, you are going to get the girl that you don't want to get because you're the guy that they, it's just like, <laughs> we have to become the people that we really want 
uh, that uh, the people that we want that they want. And by thinking yeah. about that, like if you want some pious Christian girl, well, what's she looking for? Are you that? And oftentimes I think when men really look at themselves, they say, you know what? I don't think I'm actually in the position to provide the things for the girl that I really want to marry. Well, right. there you go. That's God telling you again, as we're going to get into the, the marriage part of the of, of the Orthodox study Bible here. Well, then you're not ready. You're not in the place because every part of your life has a season and yeah. every season has a, a season of growth. You have to plant, you have to reap. And that's your entire life as a man. And so if you're unfortunately, you you're now kind of waking up, you know, like, you know what? I want to get married. I want to find a wife, but you haven't sown the seeds and reaped the rewards to be in a position where now you can get married, well, then you need to do that harvesting. And maybe it's going to be a few more years or a few more seasons before you're going to be ready for that. But if you want to have the leverage to tell a woman to say, hey, this is where I'm doing this, you need to do all those things. And if you don't, yeah. you know, I, I think it's going to be very uh, tough sledding in regards to finding a wife to submit to you and really be that helper that you want. Yeah, I agree. And the thing, the thing about submitting is that if you have a man who we're not talking about a high value man like the red pill guys would say we're talking about um like a virtuous man if your husband is virtuous submitting to him is easy it's easy like i tell people all the time about my husband he might not be nice you know how uh like women like to say nice. Is he nice? Is she nice? So well, that's not nice. Be nice. I feel like it's a very kindergarten teacher thing to tell everyone to be nice. Andrew is not necessarily nice, but he is good. And that's what makes it so easy to submit to him. I don't have to question his motivations or his intentions because of the way that he lives his life. He says things and he, he doesn't just say these things. He lives this way. He says, the way you know if you're a good man is if everyone's life around you is better because you're in it. Right. You want to be the kind of man that being in their life makes everything worse and everyone's always having to deal with your crap and the mess that you're leaving behind? Or do you want to be the kind of person that everybody wants you in their life because their, the quality of their life is better for you being in it, right? A man right. like that, if you're that kind of man and you live that way and, and you demonstrate some good leadership skills, you will not have a hard time getting a woman to submit to you. In fact, they'll bend over backwards to submit to you, especially if you do what Patrick said, which is have boundaries, have non-negotiables and show that you're, you're just not going to put up with, you know, things that go against that. Those things signal to a woman that you are trustworthy, that you are virtuous and that you're, she's safe with you. And then that makes trust and submission very easy. Um, but we don't have that right now. We have the situation where it's like the men don't trust the women because we'll look at how the women act. And then the women go, well, we don't trust the men because look how they act. And everybody, it's like the Spider-Man meme where they're pointing the fingers at each other. Yeah, it really is. That's it's exactly like that. What it is. That's yeah. Exactly so, what it is. and, and I do, I harp on the women more number one, because I'm a woman and number two, because, um, I think what happened the way we got feminism was because we moved away from real Christianity. We moved into secularism. And because of that, it, it, it changes your framework and you're starting to look at material gain and stuff like that. And so the reason men allowed feminism, never forget that it was men who allowed it. And in fact, a lot of these pro suffragists, the organizations had a lot of high ranking men in them. They had men funding them things like that. Whereas the anti-suffrage was actually run by women. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that yeah. ironic? So the men were the ones funding and wanting this because they liked the, the idea of uh, sex with no strings attached. They liked, right. uh, let's double the tax base. Let's get cheap workers. Let's right. get women in factories working. The yep. reasons why feminism was allowed to go on because men could have easily just said, no, we're not going to be having any of that. And we wouldn't have had it. Right. Uh, but the reason we did is because of the weak men, the the opportunistic simps of the time thought this was a pretty good deal. Right. Now, for men who do want a family and a life of meaning and a life of purpose, it totally screws those men over and it totally screws those women over. So if you are a Christian woman and you want to be virtuous, it becomes very hard because, number one, you have the world yelling in your ear that you're going to be abused. 
you're going to be taken advantage of. It's dangerous. It's stupid. It's naive. Uh, smart women wouldn't do those things. You can't trust a man. You can't submit. That's abuse. You're being taken advantage right, of, right? right. Yep. And then, and then you do see like some of these girls will watch like fresh and fit or whatever and stuff like that. And, um, see that the men are so like black pilled against them. And they'll say like, I, I saw one of them do a TikTok where she was like, they're just going to treat you like garbage no matter what you do. So you might as well try to get one over on them. You might as well lie. You might as well deceive them. You might as well just do whatever and be ruthless because they're that's what they're going to do to you. Right. And that's how we ended up here. But well, yeah, and that's why bad ahead. about these podcasts for all the things that are bad, you know, and I know a lot yeah. of us watch these podcasts and we're just like, oh, gosh, this is rough to even watch. <laughs> I understand. But I do appreciate and this might be controversial. I appreciate the fact that this bimbo only fans stereotype, which is unfortunately the dominant type. I have daughters that are 20 and 22, and this is what their friends are like. Right. Their friends have only fans. Their friends are trying to get, you know, fat injections in their butt and, and trying to be strippers and try. This is the dominant culture, unfortunately. And if you don't have young people in your life, maybe you don't think so. Maybe in your bubble, it's not that way. But this is the popular culture. And this is what so many young women are doing. And I like the fact that it does kind of shame this stereotype. It makes them look bad. And I, I'm i not trying to be mean, not to not to sound like Jay Dyer. I'm not trying to be mean. <laughs> but <laughs> I, think, I think that shaming both of the bad stereotypes is a good thing because that's how we get the behavior changed. If you make it desirable, if the women who are virtuous and classy and um, graceful and chaste and, and all that, all these good things, if those women are what we see the men going, wow, look at her, what a lady. She's such a, she's such a graceful lady. Isn't she like, wonderful if we saw the men saying that you just watch how fast these young girls would change right so exactly. quick if the david patrick harry's of the world had the biggest podcasts in the world and he <laughs> was having men on to talk about the kind of women that they love and want and admire and they're pointing to uh classy graceful virtuous christian women as the as the ideal you would see the culture change very fast. Uh, social shame has a lot of impact and we have to, we live in an engineered culture, but we can reverse engineer that culture if we're, if we're bold enough to try to get in there and try to have some influence. That's what I think. Right. Agreed. I want to get into the Bible here and, and talk a little bit about what the Orthodox Study Bible has to say. Before we do that, I want to answer a few super chats that came in. Um, our buddy Elias uh andrianopolis throws in 1999 and says what's up david and rachel thank you for doing a show on this topic the roles between men and women in our society have never been more muddied god bless and i totally agree they've never been more muddied and I, it, it's due to the social media and i mentioned to you offline just traveling from dublin to frankfurt germany being in southern germany going to greece i noticed that anybody in the gen z generation uh there was no differentiating factor between the cultures um older generation you can notice differences between the you know the greeks and the americans or the germans but when it came to gen z they wore everything the same the clothes the pants the shoes the brands uh, the way they moved i mean it was like there was no difference between gen z americans and gen z greeks uh from my experience traveling so I think this problem with relationships is going to become more and more prominent, unfortunately, uh, within the world, generally speaking, especially the Western world, um, just because of uh, the, the the errancy of social media. Yeah. Next sure. one comes in from Orthodox Farm Chad, throws in 999. Shout out to Nick. He says, sup, it's Nick Offinger. Just wanted to say the new thumbnails are looking fire. Well, thank you so much, Nick. I appreciate that. I uh, stopped being uh, cheap and got somebody to start making some thumbnails for me. And so they do look a lot better than mine, that's for sure. So I yeah, appreciate Yeah, I want to give a shout out to your thumbnail guy for making me, he made me look like I would look 
if I got my teeth done and lost 20 pounds and had a tan, he made me look <laughs> fabulous. So sorry <laughs> if you guys see the thumbnail and then click on the video and I'm like the meme where the kids go, mom, can we have Rachel Wilson? And the mom's like, we have Rachel Wilson at home. The thumbnail is the Rachel Wilson the kids are expecting. And this <laughs> is the Rachel Wilson we have at home that you're going to get. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, well, you still look beautiful either way. Well, uh, another super chat came say. in from uh, Chase Haggard threw in three dollars and said, "I'll have to watch this later. I have a rehearsal, but I'm sure it will be fantastic. Keep up the great work, Rachel and Patrick. Well, thank you so much, Chase Haggard." And then Doctor Vagisil threw in a few super chats here. He said, uh, "Women get neurotic when men don't have emotional stability and pick up on hints that take the lead in a situation." See y'all in Hannah Montanica. And then he threw in another one that said, <laughs> effeminate men get aggressive around you when you start establishing um, ortho mindset and random women ask for your advice and act a bit strange, not sure if it's spiritual warfare. Um, if, so effeminate men get aggressive when you start establishing an ortho mindset and random women ask for your advice and act a bit strange, not sure if it's spiritual warfare. I'm not sure. I would say my my experience, generally speaking, is that uh, um, on again my my circles are more. I don't really go any places besides the gym here online, my church. But from my experience of non, you know, dealing with non Christian men, uh, the veracity and the certainty of me stating what my values are in regards to or what I was looking for in, in a fiance or wife, um, what I was trying to build, uh, usually kind of caught them in, uh, put them on their heels. They weren't really against it, but they were surprised. You know, they probably themselves wouldn't have said it so forcefully as I was willing to say that. But that's because my house, God willing, is built on a rock and that's Christ. And so I'm coming at it from that perspective and I'm not going to compromise and I really don't care if somebody gets offended by it. So if effeminate men do get uh, aggressive or offended by you putting out your orthodox mindset, uh, then so be it. Um, I've found that generally speaking, people kind of respond well to it unless they're of a sort of progressive bend. Yeah. Amptown One throws in a dollar and says, is there something you found affected to snap people out of the Alex PWF type of mindset or are they usually stuck there? Do you have any question or response on that one? Um, well, as far as the women go, um, P women are more receptive to the stuff I'm saying than you think, even if at first, you know, they they find my Twitter, they see something I say and they'll be like, ah whatever you know they get they get like offended initially it's happened to me a lot that as they have it in the back of their minds and they're looking at their life they're usually pretty unhappy or unsatisfied they feel frustrated and at a loss of what to do about it and they start to roll it around in their minds and one of the things we're probably going to find when we look at the biblical stuff here is that you, your submission as a wife cannot be dependent upon your husband being perfect or doing X or whatever. Your husband's going to make mistakes. He's going to have misjudgments. He's going to fail you. He's a human being, just like you're a human being, and you are going to fail him as a wife. You will right. go into marriage knowing that that's going to happen and that learning to be a good wife and learning to be a, a good husband takes some time. And I think when I when I talk that way, I've really gotten through to the women. I don't know about the men, but when the women yeah. hear, oh, this is a thing I can learn, just like everything else, this is something I will learn. And my husband doesn't have to be perfect. I don't have to find a perfect man. I have to find a good man and give him grace when he makes a mistake or missteps. And you, the most important thing for me that I found in my marriage is that you don't say to yourself, I will treat him well and follow and submit once he does this or yeah, once he's proven, exactly. once he's proven to me and once I'm satisfied, then I will. Well, first of all, what makes you think you deserve to be rewarded only when you've discovered there's absolutely no risk? 
right? right. And it's trans yeah. it's a transactional mindset to a relationship, yeah. which is terrible. Yeah, terrible. you can't have so that. Corrosive. But that's that's most women and the boomer era women are absolutely that way. And they've passed that down and they've taught that to women. And so I always just say, look, you have to have the mindset that even if he's not where you imagine him being in 20 years yet, that you're already going to treat him that way. Already treat him like he's successful. Already treat him like he's worthy. Yes. Already treat him like he's doing everything right. And the magic thing that happens is men will rise to that occasion. If you have chosen right. a godly man and a, a decent, good man, and you treat him that way, he will want to be worthy of that treatment. And he will think he will start to look at himself differently and say to himself, Oh, I am that man. I am that guy. <laughs> exactly. That's right. I am. And he will do it. So, and I feel like both sides do that. And that's something I think I learned from watching like my parents' multiple divorces is that every mm. time it was always like, well, but he wouldn't do this. So I couldn't, I would have treated him good if he had. To. And it's like, no, you can't. It's not contingent upon your satisfaction that uh, there's no risk in trusting his leadership. You have to do that first and then he will rise to the occasion and you're going to get disappointed just like he's going to get disappointed with you just like as a mother your children will have something you did as a mother that they're not perfectly satisfied with you're going to fail in things in life and we all have to learn and improve and have a mindset that we're going to be in it together and learn and improve together and that's how you do it so right. for me i feel like when i talk that way women kind of get it yeah, I think for the the men speaking to Amptown's question about how do you snap somebody out of the sort of pickup artistry mindset is I don't think you can snap a man out of it until his goals change. Because men generally are very goal oriented and it could be video games. Maybe one of the reasons why a guy who is very unsuccessful and goal oriented in real life loves video games because he can accomplish and achieve goals. But if a man's goal is to pick up women and have sex, I don't think anything's going to snap him out and make him want to be a biblical man until his goals change. What he wants, his desires, his worldview, his, the expansiveness of what he wants to get out of his life. You can find somebody. I feel like I could take a young man who wants those things and doesn't have many of the building blocks. And you can build, let's say, a, a real quality man out of him compared to somebody who is very degenerate it may have a lot of the uh accoutrements that people would associate with like uh money or status or whatever so i think a man's perspective is going to be essential for quote unquote uh snapping them out of it but uh that's totally based on on the person themselves next one comes from dr vagisil says rollo is andrew if a dementor kissed him and removed his balls brain and skin color these dummies thirst for empty sex with strangers and don't realize the reward is erectile dysfunction and sexual demons. Well, yeah. Um, I don't know if Ro I, I get your point. I don't know if uh, Rolo is, uh, is Andrew with, with those uh, <laughs> kissed by a Dementor, but um, certainly I think it's weird how Rolo is like a 20 some year married man. Uh, he's in his fifties and he dresses like a much younger person and is constantly talking to girls that are in their late teens, early twenties and dunking on them publicly. Um, I would, I would, if I was in my fifties and I was had this air of the godfather of the red pill and the man of spirit, I'd want to be taken more seriously than the way he presents himself. He like wants the seriousness and yet literally acts super cringe and childish. And it's like, dude, I, I would, I, I definitely wouldn't want to be, uh, in that limelight or have that, that brand, I guess that he has. So you'll also, you'll also never catch Patrick in the all white cringe outfit with the white beanie and the chains and all that stuff either. Yeah, Certainly yeah. not in his fifties. Patrick will not be yeah, rolling like definitely that. So. Not. <laughs> and then shout out to Evan five, one, three throws in $10 says thumbnail loot. Well, thank you so much for the thumbnail. They actually are $10 a pop. So, uh, thank you so much. Evan513 for the thumbnail. I do appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, um, okay, so let's let's uh, get into, I want to read through the yeah. biblical marriage uh, section in the Orthodox Study Bible. If you guys have your Orthodox Study Bible, by the way, um, 
you can follow along. We'll be on page uh, 1607, 1607, and it has a whole section on marriage. And feel free, if you have any part that you'd like to chime in on, stop me. Um, sure. but, but now what I want to do is actually read what the Orthodox study Bible says about biblical marriage. And by the way, anybody who's still here, smash that like, uh, would really appreciate that. So the Bible, it reads here, the Bible in human history begins and ends with marriages. Adam and Eve come together in, uh, martial union in paradise before the fall, revealing marriage as a part of God's eternal purpose for humanity in the midst of creation. History closes with the marriage of the bride of the lamb, earthly marriage being filled in the heavenly, showing the eternal nature of the sacrament. Between these bookend events of history are the accounts of numerous other unions of man and wife. In the centuries-old Christian wedding ceremony used to this day in the Orthodox Church, several of these historic marriages are remembered. Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Joachim and Anna, the parents of the Virgin Mary, and Zacharias and Elizabeth. The marriage most prominently featured in the wedding ceremony, however, is the one at Cana of Galilee, described in the gospel passage read at every Orthodox wedding. In attending this wedding and performing his first miracle there, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, forever sanctified marriage. As with all the Christian sacraments, marriage is sacramental because it is blessed by God. Parenthetically, we note that it is at this wedding at Cana that Mary first intercedes with Christ on behalf of others. They have no wine. Then she calls all humanity to obey him. Whatever he says to you, do it. In modern society, as well as in Christendom, a recurring debate concerns the tensions between equality of the partners in marriage and office or order in the marriage. Often this tension has turned into a polarity between men and women, and sometimes even breeds hostility. Two elements in the Orthodox service of marriage serve to heal such tension while making clear the teaching of the church on the twin themes of equality and order concerning husband and wife. As to equality, the ceremony crowns are placed on the heads of the bride and groom. This act is symbolic of their citizenship in the kingdom of God, where there is neither male nor female, and of their dying to each other, a symbol of martyrdom. The words of St. Paul on martial equality are clear. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Husband and wife belong to each other as martyrs. They belong to God as royalty, and they are called to teach each other accordingly. As, or, but within martial equality, there's also order. The epistle passage read at the sacrament of marriage is Ephesians 5, 20 through 33, an exhortation to husbands and wives that begins with a call to submit to each other. The husband is to serve God as head of his wife, as Christ is head of the church. The wife is subject to her husband as the church is subject to Christ. There is nothing here to suggest the wife is oppressed in marriage any more than one who would call the church oppressed in its relationship to Christ. He who calls us brethren and friends exhorts the husband to love his wife, to nourish and cherish her as he himself does the church. Thus, marriage is a sacrament, holy, blessed, and everlasting in the sight of God, and his church within the bonds of marriage husband and wife experience a union with one another in love we pray for them the fruit of children and one day the joy of grandchildren and within the bonds of marriage there is both a fullness of equality between husband and wife and a clarity of the order with the husband as the icon of christ and the wife as the icon of the church man Any thoughts on that it's just so perfect. It's just so perfect that it has to come from God. Do you know what I mean? Like there is no other, that's why we wanted to do this stream. There's no other answer to this problem. The red pill guys don't have it. The dating shows don't have it. The feminists don't have it. The life coaches don't have it. That right there is so perfect that it has to be from God. It should be a sacrament. The fact that we live in a mostly Protestant nation where it's not. I mean, look at the fruits of it. So 
if everybody went into it with this mentality, it would change everything. It would change not just marriages, not just families. It would change the salvation of our nation as a whole. Like if you think of the state of our country, it would change our nation more than anything, more than any law, more than who's president, more than, um, you know, any GDP or anything like that. There's nothing else you could you could try to band-aid this country in every other way, but until we get that right, I don't think we'll have God's favor and I don't think anything's going to change and things aren't going to get better. So to me, if people could read that and take it to heart, it the the effect it would have would be incredible. I just don't see right. how you, how it could be any better. Right. It, it makes so much sense. And yeah. it calls, again... It, the the church is the hospital the church is the the nurturer the church is that which forgives us and helps redeem us christ is the one who took on the responsibility incarnated died for the sins of the world and i think it's, again it's so apropos just these sort of semiotics the archetypes of of the woman as the church and the man yeah. as an icon of christ is that i've we've done streams before you really can't describe anything more masculine than christ what you know the ultimate leader the ultimate sacrificial uh partner and that's another thing that we haven't talked about in regards to the masculine qualities of a biblical husband obviously leadership being a decision maker um um being the pro provider and the protector but also the sacrifice as you talked about andrew working uh 60 plus hours a week that is the boat that we're going to sign up for as men is that we are going to be uh again the manosphere likes to talk about how or men, men are the uh they're, they're the ones that can be um you know sort of cast away they're they're the ones that are expendable uh through the history of war and all this different stuff and the women well that's true but also within the marriage we were in a way we're signing up for that um that sacrifice of our work, our labor. And so if you're going to provide for your wife, when we're talking about the wives not having to work and doing all this stuff, well, that means you're probably going to have to work twice as much. And that's part of your salvation. You see the responsibility the man has to take on as the husband to provide, to protect, to lead. And, and also I would say, I was reading one article and they touched a little bit on this, but a sort of unconditional love maybe this isn't articulated as much for the a biblical husband, but like the love for his wife and his family and his children really needs to be of a profound level for him to really take on that whole sacrifice. And so again, that's going to be being in a relationship with a woman who gets back to all the values that you said, that is a helper, that is submissive, that is pure, that is kind and gentle, that is a nurturer that's going to feed back, as you said, you, you know, treat your man this way and he may then arise to the standards. I think that is true. And I think a man, if a woman treats him that way, he then wants to be the hero. I think every man wants to be in a way, the hero of his partner, the hero of his wife. Yeah. She has to give him that opportunity and then he has to capitalize on the opportunity and do it. And yeah. if he doesn't, um, I, I, and it's something that works out. It's not like there's this one window. Oh, I didn't capitalize, but it's a lifestyle. It's continued. Yeah. It's again. Oh, hu oh, you know, your husband. Oh, wow. He, 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 another week, he actually worked 72 hours this week. You know, he worked so darn hard for us. That is capturing that window of being the hero for your spouse. I think every man really wants that. And he and he needs to live up to that. That's what makes your life meaningful. And then a woman want, needs to be in a position where she wants that type of man and she gives him then the respect and the love and the nurture and the focus on the family that then makes that like empowering. Because then the man's like, you know what? I came home. I got my weekend. You know, my wife, my kids were there and I'm ready to go back and do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And the when we think about the wife being the church, think about the Orthodox Church. Think about what we mean when we say the church and how it's like a pillar of our salvation and how uh, God promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Like, that's a pretty big thing to live up to as a wife, right? I'm supposed to be like the church. That's a very high standard as well. I mean, the men have Christ, the ultimate standard, and then we have the church. It's like, 
that if you have that mindset, it's going to be more natural for you to be submissive, to trust your husband, um, because that's what submissiveness is about. That's why so many women hear that word and they hesitate. They immediately pull back and they, their knee jerk reaction is to be like, I don't know. I don't know about submission. Submission sounds scary. It sounds risky. It sounds like I could potentially be, you know, mistreated. But if the husband has the understanding that he is supposed to be like Christ and the wife has the understanding that she is supposed to be like the church, it makes submission make more sense. It helps you to understand it on a level other than just, oh, he's bigger and stronger than you. It's it's not really about that. That's the material reality of the world we live in. The men are bigger and stronger and they have a monopoly on force. And we should consider that. But when you think about the fact that they're called to total sacrifice for us, you know, it's like it just makes it more of a, a natural, obvious thing for women to be more submissive and to not be fighting for and vying for control and for power and all of that stuff. And there's nothing that will kill a marriage faster. There's nothing that will kill a marriage faster than a man feeling like his wife is constantly competing with him for control and influence and power in, in, in their lives and that everything he does is questioned and that everything he does is, you know, he's getting nagged and things like that. So I think that if women thought of themselves as the church and they were like, am I being to my husband as the church is to Christ? It puts things in a lens that the red pill can't and that feminism can't. And it makes the marriage what it's supposed to be. Agreed. I couldn't agree more. I know we're coming up on a uh, time that both of us need to get off here. I wanted to also say somebody m mistook uh, me talking about the church and forgive. Of course, God forgives us. Um, I was meaning that's why we as Orthodox participate in confession. So we go to confession to confess our sins in front of other people. Of course, God forgives us. The priest hears that confession. We do it in front of an icon of Christ. We confess all our sins to God. God always forgives us. You wouldn't be a Christian if you didn't understand that framework. But it's the church where we really participate in the, re the reality of confession. If you're Protestant, then you don't have that. Um, I would say, again, that's why they don't have a full concept of the church. I would say that's why they don't have a full concept of the of the feminine. You've talked about the Theotokos before and how they really don't have a sort of sacred feminine in the Protestant worldview. And you look at the Protestant countries, there are no Protestant countries left because <laughs> all of them that were Protestant are now so progressive Excellent. and woke. But yeah. Um, yes, I totally agree with the person who is trying to correct me. Of course, God forgives us. My point was that, that we go to the church uh, to participate in that forgiveness, to participate in the life of Christ, to participate in that incarnational reality and that sacrifice. So uh, didn't want that to be uh, misunderstood by anybody. Also, yeah. uh, Zachary Hadley throws in 499 and says, submit like I submit this essay for your approval. Submif submissiveness is a strength, not a weakness. And Regarding this, I would say this is part, uh, and thank you very much, Zachary Hadley, for the 499 Super Chat. I would say um, that if uh, this is where I've talked with Americans and Protestants alike that want to talk about how, oh, I can't believe you, you know, kiss the ring, dude, kiss the ring. Oh, you're one of those Orthodox? Yeah, you, I bet you kiss the hand of your priest. Yeah. And then, and it's like, dude, this is where submissiveness, even as a man, why submissiveness to Christ, submissiveness to God is so important. You see, yes. if the woman for, okay, let's just take my own personal example. So my fiance, God willing, again, we haven't been married yet and uh, we haven't ha shared a life together, but God willing, where we both want to go. The only reason why she is so submissive to me and thanks is because I'm so submissive to God. So you talked about all those boundaries. You talked about, hey, a woman will fall head over heels if you're, um, you know, you're a leader, you're you're oriented, you're looking for the right stuff. You have boundaries and you don't compromise. And I agree with you. And I'd say that God gives you that framework and that ability to be that. I don't want to say stubborn, but certainly that that more hardened uh, masculine approach. But that, become, that comes from me submitting to God, submitting to Christ, praying, 
participating in the reality of the church. And that also then comes from, say, my priest is incredibly sinful man. You know, again, like just to, to, to play the devil's advocate of the people who want to mock Catholics and, and Orthodox because we kiss the hand of our priest. Let's say he is. Do you, does that hurt my salvation or does that improve my salvation? That I would still humbly submit to a man who's even a sinner. Because I'm obviously I don't we don't worship our priests, but by being humble, it only brings me closer to God. And so that's where submission to God and humbling myself within the authority and the hierarchy of the church that only does uh, ben, that only benefits my soul. And by me being that and being that role for oh, I think something happened to um, something happened to Rachel. Uh, but anyways, by me doing that and having that role for my children is only going to benefit them. So Zachary Hadley, I definitely appreciate that brother. And I totally agree with you. Submissiveness is a strength, not a weakness, especially when we're submitting to God. Um, and, and that's a huge part that I think people that come from a Protestant or even a very American mindset, they just don't fully grasp. So anyways, uh, oh, here we got another one comes in from Frankie D. Shout out to my buddy, Frankie D. Anyways, I, I want to say uh, thank you very much, Zachary Hadley, for that. I do appreciate it. Um, exactly. Uh, when we kiss the hand of the priest, you're kissing the hand, that blessing uh, you on behalf of God. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so Frankie D throws in 1999. Shout out to Frankie D. He says, hey, bro, sorry I missed the stream. I'm working from um, 6 in the morning to 1800 mountain, uh, mountain time. I'm super excited for the Elliot stream tomorrow, but will not be able to super chat since I will be on a work computer. I followed Elliot since 2013. I'm excited for the stream tomorrow too, with Elliot holes. So I've, I followed Elliot holes. Jeez. You say 2013. I'd say definitely by then I was okay. Um, so I was definitely, following Elliot Hulse, you know, at least 10 years ago, if not more. And so I'm really excited to, uh, to have Elliot come back on or not come back on, but come on and be able to talk about, uh, masculinity, Christianity, because Elliot got, went through a very similar journey to myself. He was into the new age and the Eastern mysticism. And he did even did a period with yoga and like goddess worship. And now he's, a traditional Catholic, and he's basically totally reoriented his strength camp and his his uh, fitness stuff to focus towards Christian masculinity and doing away with vice. So I'm really excited for my conversation with Elliot tomorrow as well. Frankie D, thank you so much, brother. I do appreciate it. Rachel, did you have some technical difficulties there? I did. I don't know what happened. My internet just completely went out for a minute, and then it came back. So no worries, no worries. <laughs> Um, that looked like that was, uh, the last super chat I had on my end. Okay. Um, I wanted to thank you again from coming on. Was there anything that we, we missed? I, I, I did a, a bit of reading in preparation for today. So, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything in specific. Um, I did want to, maybe we can finish with this one real quick. Um, read Ephesians 22 through 27, which is again, where I got, if you're in a, if you go to an Orthodox study Bible, go to Ephesians chapter five. This is where Paul talks about marriage. And this is where you're going to find um, the whole section of the, in the Orthodox study Bible, laying out what we perceive marriage to be. And if you have an Orthodox study Bible, you'll be able to read what I read to you guys. But Ephesians five says, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. And in relation to that, one of the things I did want to mention was the crowning and the Orthodox ceremony of marriage. One of the things that I love that the Western rituals that we typically go to or what we would typically associate with a wedding, 
they don't wear crowns and they don't participate in this martyrdom that is very explicit within orthodoxy. That one, the female body is becoming the male's body and the male's body is becoming the female's body. And that exchange is one, the man must be the sacrificial one that's going to, again, that's where the protection comes in. If there's a bump in the night, you're signing up that you're the first one to die. But there's also been a lot of discussion. I'd like to hear your opinion about this within the trans spheres is about sex and women withholding sex or using sex as a sort of leverage within a within their relationship. Now, obviously, the church, this would be a conversation for your spiritual father. But generally speaking, and I'm not a priest, so I'm not giving any spiritual advice, but generally speaking, theologically, it goes both ways. If I'm the man and I'm signing up to basically die in protection of you from that point forward, also, your body is mine if I am wishing for intimate relationships. Yeah. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? Because I've seen in trad circles, this has been lately, last few weeks, this has been pretty common and popular on Twitter. Yeah, um, this is super controversial. It's something I do want to talk about more, and I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble, as I like to do often. Uh, when people ask me, you know, they'll, they'll make references to marital grape. Um, I don't really believe in that for the reason you just stated. I don't think that that's a thing. Now, of course, say you're sick or something and your husband uh, should have the good graces to, you know, be understanding about situations where maybe you can't or really don't want to because you're, you're not feeling well or things like that. But no, to withhold for purposes of manipulation, control, power dynamics, to punish the other person anything like that, I think is breaking the marriage contract, in my opinion, the vows, it's not even a contract, but it's to break the sacrament. It's a gross violation. In my opinion, I think it's a big problem. Uh, I found some statistics recently that say something like a third of all marriages are sexless. That's oh my gosh, terrible. a third? A third. It's one of the main reasons when men do file for divorce, it's what they say the problem is more often than not. And I think that, um, it's probably one of the biggest problems that we don't like to talk about and we should talk more about it and it could probably be its own stream. But um, I, I just think that that is breaking your vow. I don't think you should do that. And I think it's a, a horrible thing to do to say to a man, please never sleep with anyone but me for the rest of your life. But also I'm not going to sleep with you anymore. You, you just can't do that in my opinion. So. Right. Agreed. Well, I know we're going to get ready to hop off here right now. I just want to get this last super chat. Shout out to Sabrina Fair. Uh, thank you so much. And God bless your family. She throws in 999 and says pearls from every stream with Rachel. Thank you both. Congratulations on your engagement. Well, thank you so much, Sabrina. Thanks, Sabrina. And, you know, we, we have done so many streams together, but you're still always one of the most popularly requested people. Um, even though we do one basically about every month at this point, every month or two months. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so your work, it's impacting a lot of people. People love what you do. Congratulations on the new book that's coming out. I saw that you just had audible yes. finish your, for your first book. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on that. That's gotta be really exciting. Um, when, it, when mm -hmm. are you expecting the release date on the second book here? Uh, probably end of summer. I do have summer. a Spanish version of occult feminism, which will be out in like two weeks. So it will be in Espanol. So that's going to be great. Um, can reach a lot more people that way. But yeah, the next book is my 15 best arguments against feminism with all of the juicy stats and facts and statistics and citations that we want. Right. And I really, I want it to go out to the world for everybody who wants to argue from a position like mine, but they don't have all of that research and information and, and the arguments put together for it to kind of be a guide for how to do it. Because I do get a lot of messages from people going, man, I want to, I want to explain it like you do, or I want to argue it with someone like you do, but I, I don't know all the stuff and I don't have all the info. So I want to just put it, my whole case together, all the things you guys have heard me say in debates and stuff like that in one place cite all of it and just make kind of a manual on how to argue against feminism and defeat it. So, right. Excellent. And, yeah. Excellent. I want to give a special shout out to all the super chatters. Thank you so much, Elias. Thank you so much, Nick. 
Evan513, Zachary Hadley, Frankie D, Sabrina Fair, uh, Dr. Vagisil, uh, Amp Town One, and Chase Haggard. Thank you all so much for supporting. And I will be back tomorrow morning at 12:30 p.m. I guess it's afternoon technically, but depending on where you're at in the world. Um, and I will be joined by the great Elliot Hulse. Uh, we'll be talking about strong bodies, strong souls. What exactly is Christian masculinity? And so I will see you all then. Rachel, thank you so much. Uh, anything you want to tell the people or promote your, your at link in the YouTube video takes you yep. straight to your YouTube channel. Uh, and you have a link in my video description. Anything you want to share with people? No, that's it for me. Uh, go sub to my YouTube if you haven't yet, because I've got lots of really exciting, fun stuff coming up there. And I, I love doing these streams with Patrick, so there will be more of those. Um, so, yeah, just follow me there. Thanks. Frankie D says, hey, Rachel, bueno suerte con tu libro. Viva Franco. Ha ha, <laughs> Dios lo bendiga. No habla, Frankie D. I had a translator <laughs> had a translator do the book for me, but I appreciate the sentiment, I guess. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Tell your uh Thanks, tell your angry and mean husband I said hello and that I, <laughs> I, I love him. And I will uh and, and I am thinking about going to Nashville with you guys. I'm leaning towards it. So I think I will meet you guys there. That would but, be amazing. Um, yeah, I'll keep, I'll tell Andrew, I'll reach out to him here in a few. But okay. anyways, thank you so much and God bless all your work. And I will be mm -hmm. back tomorrow. Until then, as always, God bless.